All right. We're here today with Mark Manone. How are you doing today, man? I'm good. How are you doing, young Southpaw? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. That's good. It's nice yeah. to connect. It is. We're 16 hours apart. It's crazy. Can't get my head around it. Yeah, I know. Um, here I am in the future. It's, and it's great. I have to tell you, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank goodness, man. I've been worried. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Everything going on in the world, just got to wait 16 hours, though. No? Well, I'm here to tell you that 16 hours in, in, uh, <laughs> in advance is a wonderful place to be. That, that is so reassuring to hear. <laughs> So do you remember what made you fall in love with music in the first place when you were young? Hmm. Gee. Um, I think it was the, um, I think weirdly uh, it was, cause I, I grew up with an older sister who was three years older than me and I kind of idolized her every move and, and, and that sort of thing. So I think it was kind of the show, the showiness of it. Like as far as like rock music goes, like my sister was really, big into um you know dancing and getting dressed up and she would dress me up as gene simmons and she'd be paul stanley and that kind of thing so i think it was like just the fun the kind of like the sort of fun recklessness and 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 the the um uh, over the top um costumes and just just the whole visual aspect of it as well as the the music i mean I think that was a big deal for me. It would, I think it would have been different if I grew up just listening to the radio and had no um, sort of video component or something like that as well. Yeah, totally. Like my older cousins always were like, you know, really excited about the music they were into. And you know, of course it like, you know, wore off on me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's a great thing. It's easy to you know pass things down if you're really passionate about them. So it's, um, it's nice to have a younger sibling or cousin or something to, to offload that stuff too. So she dressed you up as Gene Simmons? Yeah, yeah. I got Gene, which I was pretty happy with, to tell you the truth. I mean, you know, even though he seems like a bit of a scumbag these days, I mean, I was really into the bass early on, like the bass I was, guitar. Was I was nice. going to ask, is that what uh, sealed the deal with the bass for you? <laughs> I don't know if it sealed the deal, but it definitely um, brought it into my line of vision a bit more. Um, when I was a little kid so um, yeah especially that one that was like shaped like the axe that 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 one Very sounded cool. great just because it looked like an axe yeah. so <laughs> have you ever thought about what your makeup would be if you joined KISS hmm it'd probably be something clownish like like a sad clown maybe with like uh like you know a one uh like broken glasses with you know one black eye sort of thing and uh i love yeah. it i think you yeah. have a double bass attack with the sad clown <laughs> and the demon <laughs> yeah i'd love to do that i mean yeah geez that would be a dream <laughs> <laughs> so when did you realize that music was what you wanted to do with your life um probably around that time okay. <laughs> uh, no i i um uh, I don't know, like, because when I started learning, like actually taking guitar lessons in high school, I was terrible for so long. I was just pathetic. And um, all these other kids were just getting so good at it. And I just was pretty hopeless, uh, you know, chubby fingers, pretty uncoordinated. And just, um, I just kept at it. And I think, um, I, I don't know, I think that really just drove home, like, just just really working hard at it and realizing that that i was getting somewhere with it that was a um like a great feeling of overcoming you know some adversity and having success in something small and um you know playing starting to play school concerts and things like that um it was a real buzz but um yeah as far as like you know after school and i i think when i met when i met um the guys in the locksmiths uh in high school i think that was like I was like I really clicked with them. Um, even though musically it was probably probably a little bit different to what I was listening to, um, but um, it was just like getting together with people who were quite, I guess, organised and um, and really keen to rehearse and just um, write songs as much as possible. And that like up till that point, I was just playing basically covers and trying to write a few of my own songs. But when I met Marty Donald in high school, he just had like 
notebooks upon notebooks just full of lyrics and I was just like kind of captivated by that whole that whole aspect I didn't realize that people were actually you know dedicating their all their free time to to sitting around writing songs so that was a yeah. real turning point what sort of stuff were you listening to then oh man just like you know your mixed grab bag of teenage boy stuff um Jimi Hendrix uh the Ramones um like Rolling Stones, just basically, you know, kind of something that you, you know, something with a great back catalogue that you could dive into. I was sort of pretty passionate. Credence, I was really into Kings. I guess a lot of 60s stuff. Um, um, whereas Marty was more kind of listening to like 80s indie pop stuff. Um, a lot of the Smiths and um, Lloyd Cole and uh, stuff like that. So um, that was interesting, sort of being opened up to a different world of music as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, like, well, um, I became, when I was in about year seven or year eight, through my sister again, um, I, I started listening to Midnight Oil. Uh, I'm not sure how much you know about Midnight Oil in, uh, in Florida, but... Um, I loved uh, Forgotten Years. I remember seeing the world premiere of that video and just being like, wow, this is super catchy. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, uh, I guess I was, when I was like 13, 14, I sort of fancied myself as a bit of a political activist. <laughs> um, and I got really into like, I mean, just just basically what, what me not all were espousing, which was, you know, land rights for, for indigenous people and, and, and nuclear disarmament and things like that. So I, I didn't really understand about like the, the mechanics of it all, but I just kind of had this real surface level um, passion, you know, to, you know, to fight the power. And, um, and so I started writing um, a fair few horrible, <laughs> like sort of uh, anthems. Um, they were pretty terrible. I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to even tell you that much, but um, I think the like the lowest point, and my friends bring this up occasionally, so I don't mind telling you about it. Um, one song that was called Butcher Baker Uranium Miner, <laughs> and it was just um, really horrific. And like, Sounds yeah, real snappy. Yeah, yeah, it's real <laughs> snappy. Yeah, I think that was, uh, I think I was uh, 13 when I wrote that. So, um, yeah, I was. I kind of like after I, I went through that phase, I didn't write any new material till I was in my twenties, <laughs> like it, lyrics wise. Anyway, it took me a while to sort of sift that out of my system. So, what was the first song you wrote where you're like, "Oh, I can actually do this. This is a good tune." <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, like, as in wrote the lyrics or, or like collaborated on music. Do you mean or? Um. I guess whatever song, you know, inspired that in you that you're like, oh, uh, thing. Yeah, I guess like any of that real real early Locksmith stuff, you know, once we started playing, it, it was kind of um yeah, just fun and real simple and and um just not really kind of uh trying to emulate anyone in particular, anyone's sound or anything like that. Um and yeah, so I guess just like that early Locksmith stuff, like um Cat in Sunshine or, you know, which, um, you know, we look back now and whenever I talk to Marty about that stuff, he just cringes and curls up in a ball and wants to cry. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, like just that music made me feel really confident about going out and playing in front of people and giving it a good crack. Cool. Yeah. So it seems like every week I'm getting a band camp update that Lost and Lonesome has a new release or a new reissue out to check out. So <laughs> tell me about the label, man. You, you just received one right then? Yeah, by the way. <laughs> they come like, yeah, every couple hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the label has been really busy. Like, um, even though this year, you know, obviously it got slowed down by the thing, um, there's been, I, I guess I sort of, at the start of the year before, before, before anything happened, you know, with locking things down or anything, I um, I was kind of like, well, a lot of the early releases from the label, like late nineties, early noughties sort of stuff, hasn't really uh, isn't available digitally or anything. So it's kind of just like 
floating out on CDs somewhere and, you know, no one's probably listening to it. So I was like, this is terrible. Like I need to uh, make it available so people can hear it. And I, I, I was like, well, the label's been going for 20 odd years. Like it's probably a good time to, to re, you know, relaunch a lot of that stuff. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's sort of been quite a hectic uh, several past few months, just getting all that out there. Um, and it doesn't seem like much work. It's like, oh yeah, the song's already there and this and that, but it's just like so much boring stuff to do. Metadata. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and just, yeah, just stuff that you forget and you're like, oh no, that, that song's coming out tomorrow and I didn't do this and this and this. So yeah, it's just like my life is just one, like balancing uh, anxiety and guilt. Like it's one or the other at any given time. It's like, oh no, I didn't do that. But, oh God, I gotta do that thing. So yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking about it. If you know, if I had my time again, I wouldn't have started a record label. It's just <laughs> it's one of those things that just you just can't stop once it's going. You've just got like lots of lots of um people relying on you to do some stuff occasionally. But I mean it is fun too. And I get to do fun interviews with Young Southpaw. So, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many releases have you put out? Uh, kind of, well, that's kind of debatable because um, uh, a lot of the, like the Luxmiths releases uh, were transferred over when Candle Records closed down. So I, I haven't, I didn't, like they're, they're counted in the catalogue as a Lost and Lonesome release, but originally it was, you know, there's like 20 releases there or you know, 15 yeah. that, that weren't, um, uh, originally on Lost and Lonesome, but somewhere up, you know, 100, 120 or so. Wow. Somewhere. Like yeah. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's not like huge, but it's, it's decent for, it's you hefty. know, one, one dude in his lounge room <laughs> trying to get yeah. stuff over the line. And uh, that foot, the foot's reissues. I was digging those, that song Fickle. Oh, yeah. Really good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And the, that was the first release on Lots and Lots of? That, that was, yeah. That album um, was, uh, was Fickle off the first album? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it was uh, the first release. Yeah. We, we, Jane from the Foots and I started the label uh, and, and we talked, we got together and had weekly meetings for about a year before anything actually happened. <laughs> Cause we were like, we had all these uh, ideas and things that were, you know, uh, that we wanted to do, but they all just took quite a while to, to come to fruition. So, um, you know, we had plenty of time to go down to the business registration office and set things up and do it properly, which at the time we were just like, yeah, cool. We'll just send out some, uh, hard copy, um, newsletters to people who are on our mailing list, postcards. And, mm -hmm. um, and we would just sell some CDs and it was a pretty like, uh, little humble little um cottage industry so it was it wasn't really something that we thought was going to carry on for any period of time and and jane's very wisely bailed out after about three years <laughs> but we're still good buddies so um yeah they've actually been working on some new material so oh. yeah the foots and i think well i'm not sure if they've officially changed their name but they did a show recently as a two-piece and were called cheeses cheese let's in chip types of cheese um so yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure how i feel about the juxtaposition between foot and cheese <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure that's occurred to them but you know it's definitely what next jams <laughs> Ugh, gross how'd you decide on the name lost and lonesome um we we that was like we were trying to come up with really cool sort of country sounding country music sounding name and yeah, um perfect country sounding yeah <laughs> yeah i don't know why we i think we were listening to a lot of country music at the time and just sort of you know uh riffing on that idea um but we've only ever released one country two country albums so yeah um what were those? We'll, uh that was uh, actually jane's other uh, band fibro town okay um which was an amazing album they were, they were a great live band from melbourne and um, a, a co-release of um, Sunny in the Sunsets, a uh, long-time companion. 
Oh, um, yeah. Which, yeah, still remains one of my all-time favourite records. Nice. Like, on any level. Yeah, so, cool. um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, maybe one day we'll do some more country music. I like it. <laughs> what are your other all-time favourite records? Um, oh, gee. It's kind of changed. I was thinking about my like my desert island discs from maybe you know ten years ago, and I think that, well, I think something like uh, Jonathan sings by Jonathan Richmond is still kind of uh, up there, and um, uh, that first television personalities record mm-hmm. is just outstanding. I still love that one. Um, other than that, it's it's kind of hard. I mean, I I would maybe put one or you know, one teenage fan club album in there. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. What, what, what about yourself? My favorite album of all time. Well, I have two kind of two side, um, Van Halen's 1984. Nice. Cause it was the album that made me fall in love with music. Again, my older cousins, you know, were hugely into it. I was eight years old that summer, but you know, yeah. you know, just, yeah, Panama, just so exciting. Yeah. 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 And, uh, the Afghan wigs, black love. That's oh, another cool. favorite. Uh, yeah. Suede's Dogman Star. Uh-huh. Um, and actually, I, I revised mine recently, too, because I realized that ACDC's Power Ridge is just an incredible ass-kicking record. And I, I've loved that record <laughs> since I was, like, 12 years old. And I yeah, I sure. You gotta... kick recently, and I was just like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess, like, ACDC is going to get a hall pass in any in any uh, top five for anyone out there, there's probably some record that you didn't even realize that you've been listening to your whole life. Yeah. <laughs> Were you ever um, a fan? Um, I wouldn't say I was a fan, but I've definitely, I definitely, you know, have a love for them because yeah, it kind of impossible to grow up in Australia without hearing it yeah. somewhere. And, um, you know, if you're at the pub or something and it, some DJ puts a song on, it's, you know, it's the best thing you'll hear all night sort of thing. Um, but, uh, and are those records that, that you would still listen to these days? Like, would you still put those ones on that you? Oh yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. And like, like, like 1984, would you put that on as a nostalgic thing or would you just put it on and sort of, can you still sort of hear fresh? I, I still get excited. Uh, you know, when yeah. I hear it. And then like when Eddie died, you know, a couple of months ago, I was just, yeah. I mean, I don't, I've never really cried over celebrities, but that hit hard because it was tied yeah. up with all these memories of, you know, family times and falling in love with music and like, you know, yeah. this is what I want to do with my life. And it's just. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember there was a, I was living in Connecticut last year up in the Northeast and uh, yep. there was a Monday night comedy thing. And, you know, um, Greg, the DJ at the night would, you know, he'd play whatever song you wanted when you're walking on stage. And I always have him play Van Halen. And it was just like this incredible feeling of just you know, walking yeah, up to like wow. this kick, ass kicking riff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, well, I, during this ACDC kick of the past, however many weeks, I watched a bunch of documentaries online and there's the talk about them, you know, they got quite big in Australia and then they moved to London because they wanted to, you know, take it further. And they were saying yeah. they, they could have easily just stayed in Australia and it ended up like, and they named some artists who were, you know, quite successful, but, you know, not known internationally. I was wondering yeah. who are some like the Australian artists that you are fond of who, you know, people outside Australia might not know. Oh, that's a good question. Um, like kind of like, uh, what's the word? Seminal ones you mean for, for, you know, like my Anyone. generation or something like that. Um, ah, <laughs> oh, geez. Um, well, I guess, um, was it like Cold Chisel? Have you, have you ever heard that band? I know the name. I don't think I've ever listened to them though. Yeah, they're kind of like ubiquitous here. Like mm. you, can't, you, you can't go down to, you can't walk down the street without hearing one of their songs wafting through the air. You, you know, you're in a supermarket and something will come on. Like, and they've got like one or two songs that are kind of like, well, one song in particular, it's just like the, the biggest torch song ever written in australia and it's like um it's like a it's like a vietnam veteran sort of song you know uh i guess it's like a free bird style song you know if you're if you're playing a show and someone doesn't like you they'll yell out play k san and that's kind of like uh yeah that's kind of like the biggest put down you could get even though you know it's a great song and um 
but uh, yeah, that I, that I was actually into I was into cold chisel again through my sister <laughs> when I was um, when I was in high school. But um, yeah, they sort of dropped by the wayside a bit. But yeah, uh, I I was surprised they never sort of made it big overseas. Um, they're just massive here. Um, who else? That that'd probably be the biggest one, I'd say. Um, I can't think. There was some uh, consternation over on a church Facebook group. The church, the band, not the, the church. Band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, Rolling Stone Australia recently put out a top 50 Aussie bands list and the church weren't on it at all, which is really shocking. And like yeah. the go-betweens and the Triffids were pretty far down the list as well. I mean, I, was, I, I wasn't holding anything with this list. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ACDC uh, did top it, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely different schools of thought here about, you know, bands like that like a band like the church is definitely still um considered more of a sort of a cult band rather than a big sort of famous rock band but they've got maybe two songs that will get played on commercial radio all the time but um outside of that no one that listens to that stuff would actually hunt down their records and try and you know hear about their sort of early sort of paisley underground stuff or anything like that yeah they're they're cool though i love i love the church yeah, and you were saying before how, like, discovering uh, an artist who had, like, a huge back catalog to get into, they mm. were like that for me. I mean, I had heard Starfish, you know, New Under the yep. Whip, and, you know, I like that song, but I never really mm-hmm. listened to it. And then someone posted some a Maya one day, uh, just like 10 years ago, and I was just like, oh, this is an incredible song. Then I looked them up again, and there were, like, you know, 20 albums to go back and listen to. So yeah, yeah. You think as you cool. get older, there, you don't really discover more bands like that, but this was, you know, a real treasure to find. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Absolutely. The church, the band, that is. Not, yes. the... <laughs> not a religious <laughs> institution. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now, you guys, the Luxmiths, were in London for a while. Um, in 2003, I was living there in the autumn. And I saw you guys a bunch. Were you like, had you moved there? Or were you just on like an extended tour? No, we were just, yeah, back and forth. Like we were touring around Europe. And I think we just, um, I think we just sort of bounced bounced back and forth a bit and played in London a few times. But um, uh, variously, we've lived there uh, over the years. Tali, our singer, lived there for maybe two or three years. Maybe it was like 99 till 2001 or something like that. Um, and I was living there 2005, 2006. Um, but yeah, we never actually, we never did the big, band move and you know headed over there and tried to crack the scene or anything so that was just that was just um a nice thing that we got to do i guess there's a lot of aussie expats over in london so we always had a bit of a crowd ready-made crowd that was very nice but um yeah Yeah. maybe we were never very we were never very careerist in that way we didn't like think oh what's the next step for us you know we just kind of just went along doing our thing and just sort of if we got to tour, we got to tour. So that was the way we played it. Those shows were great. I remember, uh, I think it was the LSE with the Eisler set. And uh, then, yeah. Um, I don't know, some Strange Fruit stuff that autumn. Yeah, that was, that was, that show was so fun. Was it, was Comet Gain on that bill as well? Or? So. Yeah. Probably. I mean, yeah. it was <laughs> wild. It was a huge but. night. Yeah, yeah. And then I was at the uh, the Scala show, the last one in London. That mm. was with Daniel Kitson, who I love as well. <laughs> yeah, that's still one of the wildest things I've ever seen happen on stage was Daniel Kitson's stand-up routine that night. It was just like, wow, how did, like, if you had not heard of that guy or knew who he was, most of the audience, I'm pretty sure, would have felt kind of alienated by everything that came out of his <laughs> mouth. <laughs> yep. Um, and it was just like, oh man, what? You just, like, I've seen him a bunch. And when, you know, we were stoked when, when we asked him and he said he'd happily play. Um, like, we were just so excited. And then, like, we were just up the back, just like, like bent over, just laughing hysterically. It was too much. It was too, almost couldn't go on ourselves after that. It was, yeah. <laughs> So how psyched were you when you realized you could use the name Manone alone for your solo stuff? I mean, that's, that's oh, pretty man. good. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't that psyched. To tell you the truth, it wasn't really my idea. It was um, uh, 
going back to to the to London, um, Sean, who ran Fortuna Park Records. So when I when I went and spent a bit of time there in you know two thousand five or so, um, and did uh, like started playing the occasional acoustic solo show, or whatever. Um, he started right, you know, he would write it on the blackboard, you know, at the front of the pub or whatever that Monona Lone was playing. Um, and that was his little, uh, little wise crack. And then like, it just sort of ca- caught on. And <laughs> then I finally got a band together. That's a, you know, full-time band that I happen to be in. It's not like my band. It's just like four of us. They're like, nah, you can't change the name. The name's too good. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't want to be regarded as a solo artist or anything. So it just seems, um, yeah, kind of at odds with that <laughs> massively. Like everyone's like, what? You got a, you got a band? Um, you know, I'd want to be called something. Yeah. I don't want, yeah. I'd, I'd like a cool name, but maybe one day. <laughs> so I really dug the single uh, Do It Twice when it came out last year. Tell me about that one. Um. That that uh, song was um, uh, that actually the end of that song was kind of uh, a, it wasn't a locksmith song but we had um, worked on it as an idea for a long time and it just never ended up in a song and I was just like all right I'm just I really like the end of that I, I like that part that that music the little riff that comes in at the end and I want to write a song about I want to write a song around that and I don't even care. Um, you know, it's just basically the song just has to lead up to this cool riff at the end. And so it's like, uh, <laughs> it was just by chance that, um, the, the rest of the song had a few other good ideas in it, um, and worked out because I was just like, I'm sick of having this piece of music that I really like and every band I'm in, we jam it and it sounds really fun. And then there's no song to have with it. So, um, yeah, it kind of like, it was, it feels real like a kinks uh, riff or something at, at the end and, and I really like that um, uh, yeah but um, and t- t- the song itself um, yeah it's just basically about um, you know getting a chance to have a, a do over and everything that you've sort of messed up along the way and uh, um, yeah I guess you know when you get in your 40s you there's a few things you kind of feel like you could have done differently <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, yeah, Sonny Smith, Sonny in the Sunsets, uh, Sonny was like, when he heard the chorus of the song, he was like, you've ripped my, you've ripped my song off. Like, cause there's like a line that vaguely, and I was like, I didn't rip your song off. I ripped off the Beach Boys. Like, <laughs> um, and you know, he's, he's a good one to talk about ripping off. <laughs> <laughs> Just between you and me. Yeah, no one else will know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one. So have you been making music this year? Or? Uh yeah, actually. Yeah, I've been uh I, I borrowed um uh my friend Jane, who I started a label with. She loaned me her um her eight track uh cassette recorder, um Tascam six eighty eight. Nice. And I've just been playing with that. Yeah. So yeah, during the lockdown and everything, it's just been really nice, sort of little fun. Uh I because I'm not really big into home recording or you know, I don't get on band uh what do you call it? garage band or anything or or i mean i i do some recording occasionally if i have to um but um i'd rather go to a studio and do it with people that know what they're doing um <laughs> but yeah it has been really really fun to to get into that realm put the headphones on and just record some stuff so yeah i've got like a bunch of new stuff i'll probably put it out sometime next year um i can you and- still find cassette tapes like readily yeah. to, to use them. Wow. <laughs> I know it's amazing. Well, I actually, I, I got a box full of them from my friend who works at, I don't know what you'd call it over there, but he works at a tip shop. A tip shop is like uh, the garbage dump or somewhere, I guess. Is oh, that okay. what like, yeah. we, call, we call it the tip. Yeah. Uh, and he sort of works in the, like they go through everything. And if there's stuff that's worth, you know, recycling or selling on, they, they pull it aside. And he had like a whole box of, uh, these special type two tapes they're called like they they look like a regular cassette but they allow for like eight tracks to be recorded on um so yeah (laughs) 
I uh, know that's pretty amazing. So um, yeah, pl- plenty of, and th- they've all got like classical music recorded all over them. So I'm just like slowly recording over these beautiful classical music pieces. <laughs> you know, do what you got to do. It's the it's the cycle of life. What can you say? <laughs> and you were pretty much gigging right up until lockdown, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had we actually the uh, we were having a lost and lonesome um, residency uh, every, once every week uh, at a pub here, the Tote, and um, yeah, we had to shut that down halfway through. The, and the pub was yeah, the, the venue was like, well, you guys do what you got to do, and you know, it just seemed like the right idea. And you know, yeah. there were still bands. There were still you know, it was kind of like that murky area in March where everyone was like, oh, geez, I don't know. I think it's a bit of an overreaction. But um, yeah, we just pulled the plug on that. But yeah, so uh, there was a yeah, there's a lot of music going on at the start of this year, and there was nothing. The pub is called the Toe. The Tote. The Tote. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Toe is a good name for a pub. There's probably one. There's probably one in the UK called the Toe and Crow or something like that. You would hope. <laughs> Those guys that the Foots ever played there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good point. And that uh, that Soda Stream song share thing was pretty cool. I like that idea. Oh yeah, yeah. Letter from yeah. Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those guys were meant to like they were about to start recording their their own their their, their new album, and they uh, sort of put a hold on that. So that was the, to fill the void. They they did that little song share thing, pass it on record a bit and then pass it on to someone else so that was yeah it was really nice it ended up beautifully such a such a tearjerker yeah did you record that on the task here no i didn't <laughs> i recorded that in a uh, reaper or something yeah 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 a little bit of tremolo uh tremolo baritone guitar i was like what's the saddest saddest instrument out there it's got to be the tremolo baritone guitar I, I, yeah, I think I'd have to agree with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> or like the, you know, flugelhorn or something, I guess. Mm. This is, mm. <laughs> That's a good question. Is the flugelhorn sadder than the tremolo? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, right. yeah. Get them both together. You got your country album right there. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> so, what releases do you have coming up for next year? Do you have anything planned? Um, we've got a bunch of oldies, old folks finally releasing long overdue albums. Uh, bands like, um, Midstate Orange have, have been working on a new album. I dig that EP, man. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. They're an amazing band. It's just been, uh, how long has it been? Like their album came out in 2006 or something. So yeah, they've, uh, this is their follow up <laughs> album to that. Uh, and the Small Goods is another band who who put, haven't put out really any music this decade, past decade, and um, yeah, finally got a new record coming out. Um, should be some new Last Leaves, which is the the band I'm doing with really? Marty and Louis from the Luxemburg. Yeah, yeah, that album is excellent. Ah, thanks, <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so hopefully, yeah, Marty's written s- stacks of new songs again. So yeah, we've just got together the other day to have a play and sounding good already so nice yeah um aside from that it's always a surprise there's always like bands on the label who are like hey here's a master for our new recording you know can you put it out in two months (laughs) (laughs) so that's kind of you know keeps it fun i can see your anxiety and guilt you're talking about before yeah 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 (laughs) yeah it's all part of it it's a wonderful thing yeah cool man that's all my questions you got anything else you want to add anything no, no. Thanks for uh, persevering. I was like, that coughing fit was, uh, I thought that was going to hang around, but it went away quickly enough. It was the only one. Yeah. By the way, I'm COVID free. I got tested. So it's all, it's cool. Was the test as bad as people say? Oh, you, you haven't had it? No, but I probably will get oh, it soon. It's brutal. <laughs> it really is. Like, it just goes so far up your nose. Like and it's yeah, touching and your they brain. Give, yeah, they give you a tissue and you're like, what's that for? And they go, oh, you'll see and you're like your eyes just go (laughs) yeah that's pretty nuts but you feel kind of good afterwards you're like all right i did my thing 
did my thing. Must have been a relief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, super relief. Whew. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got no, I, uh, nothing else to add, really. Thanks for the questions. That was uh, very um, thorough. Oh, thank you. I well researched. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I love the podcast, too. It's really funny. It's really good and uh, informative. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you for listening, man. Cool. Very it's happy. been a pleasure. Yeah. Great chatting with you.